Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Jens Heidland Show, where I interview experts from different fields to connect the dots of innovation and entrepreneurship. Today's guest is speaker and management advisor. He's the author of several books, such as The Experience Economy, Infinite Possibility, Authenticity, and Mass Customization. Please welcome to the show, Joe Pine. Hello, Joe. Welcome on the show. Pleasure to have you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Jens. Thank you. It's great to 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 meet you again. We have, I mean, I don't know how long it is that we, <laughs> we haven't met in person, at least. It's a couple of years back. Yeah, at least three or four, probably. <laughs> yeah. So before we go into innovation, of course, uh, your books and a lot of interesting wealth of your knowledge, tell us a little bit about who you are and how did you get to the point where you are today? <laughs> well, it can, that could be a very long story, Jens. I'm not sure you want me to go into all that, but uh, you always say I'm I'm a, um, author, speaker, and management advisor. Uh, our company, Strategic Horizons, which is my co-author Jim Gilmore and and uh, our third partner Doug Parker, um, we're a thinking studio to help companies uh, uh, conceive and design uh, new ways of creating economic value for their business. And I did that um, uh, first with uh, Mass Customization, was my first book, came out in late 1992. Then The Experience Economy in 1999, uh, with an updated edition in 2011. And last year, 2020, we re-released re it in hardcover uh, with a new preview on competing for customer time, attention, money. Uh, I also have a book on authenticity, what consumers really want, and uh, um, uh, infinite possibility, creating customer value on the digital frontier, which is about how you use digital technology to fuse the real and the virtual. And I, I got into this business, basically, I started off very much as a computer nerd and worked for IBM for 13 years and started in a very technical job, moved up to management and strategy. When I was in uh, strategy, I read uh, Stan Davis's book, 1987 book called Future Perfect. And it's as Apple today as it was when he wrote it. Um, and in there, Stan coined the term mass customization. Mm -hmm. He was, he was uh, said he was playing around with words and putting different words together and so forth. And when he hit this one, it was like, oh, this has got to be something. What's that? So he has this, this, this uh, uh, chapter on mass customizing. Uh, where he talked about how you know technology was bringing down the cost of customization, and therefore eventually we get to the point where you um, could have what he called mass customized markets or markets of one, where every customer is his own market. And when I read that at IBM, it was like the heavens opened up and the angels sang because it was it was explaining everything that I saw going on. That we were we we're working on the AS400 mini computer. If any of your audience remember that that we built for a lot large homogenous marketplace that really didn't exist that every customer was unique and so i went in search of that and um, uh, ibm as a as a reward for work i had done uh, sent me to mit for a year to get my master's degree in the management of technology and i found out i had to do a thesis so i said i'm gonna do a thesis i can turn into a book and that was mass customization so i spent my whole time there um, uh, thinking about it, doing all my papers, writing about it and so forth. And I got done. My thesis was basically the first four chapters of the book. Uh, and then I expanded the rest when I got back to, to IBM. And um, I actually left IBM in um, mid-1993. But it was my biggest client for a while as I did a bunch of executive education for it. And I remember I was doing an ed executive education session for consultants from the IBM Consulting Group. It was late 1993 or early 1994, and I um, um, was talking about how mass customization automatically turns a good into a service. Mm -hmm. That if you look at the classic economic distinctions, goods are uh, standardized, but services are customized. They're done just for the individual person. Goods are inventoried after production, but services are delivered on demand when the customer says this is what they want. And part and parcel of mass customization is the intangible service because goods are, are tangible, services intangible, the intangible service of helping customers figure out what it is that they, they want. And, and after I said that, there was a consultant in the back of the room, he's sort of a smart aleck, and he, and he raised his hand. And he said, you know, you talk about service companies that mass customize, what does it turn a service into? And I shot back that mass customization automatically turns a, a service into an experience. 
And I went, whoa, that sounds good. <laughs> right, hold on a second. I got to write that down. And I figured out that that was true, that if you design a service that is so appropriate for this particular person, that, 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 that exactly what they need at this moment in time, then you can't help but make them go, wow, and turn it into a memorable event, turn it into an experience. So that means that experiences were a distinct economic offering, as distinct from services as services are from goods. And that meant that you'd have an economy based off of experiences, just like we had a agrarian economy based off commodities first, then the industrial economy based off goods and the service economy. And so that was the beginning of everything and sort of figure that out uh, up to the point where we came out with the first edition of the book in uh, 1999. Uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. And that's uh, for those who are for those who are not really into the experience economy, that's just like wait, 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 the wait. There's somebody that's not into the experience economy. <laughs> yeah, I I've guarantee heard. you, everybody's into the experience economy. They just don't know it. <laughs> exactly. Not everyone knows. So, it. For, for for those of of like the two listeners who have never heard about it, um, this book is one of the world's leading thought pieces and 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 educational books as well on the experience economy. And I mean, I have read it years back um, and and you have spoken on very, very large events and still do that, teaching others around how you can use that from a business perspective, how you can, um, how big corporations can think differently with it and so on. So I would like to get us a little bit into the innovation space of that. Yep. So because it's it's around economical and economical growth, How do you see the changes? I mean, not, the, the first book came out, what did you say, 1992? Yeah, late 92. So the development now over the, the, the last uh, 30 years, how, how did you see it evolving from an experience economy perspective? How did it work together with innovation and or not? Well, well, so, well, I, so I'll tell you a little story. I was a number of years ago, maybe 15 or, 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 or more years ago, I was in Milan, Italy, and I was doing this boardroom presentation with a, with a, um, a number of different companies, you know, executives. One was the vice president of Maxwell House, the coffee maker uh, in, in Europe. And, uh, and he said something that floored me. He said, you know, there's been no innovation in the coffee industry in 15 years. And I said, are you kidding me? Have you never heard of Starbucks? <laughs> You know, because because he's there as a manufacturer, it's like they had blinders on. We innovate only in goods because we're a manufacturer. Totally mm -hmm. missing the innovation in the coffee drinking experience that Howard Howard Schultz did at um, uh, Starbucks. And the irony, of course, being it was actually Milan, Italy, that inspired Howard Schultz when he saw the coffee culture that was there and said, I want to bring this back. And so he turned Starbucks, which was a manufacturer itself. I mean, very small, not, not like Maxwell House. But that's what they did. They bought uh, coffee from farmers and then they they roasted it and they packaged it They had one store, uh, actually just a few stores uh, in Seattle. And he came back and said, I'm going to create places where people where we make the coffee for people, where people can enjoy spending time in the place. And that's what Starbucks is. And it uh, and, and it shows that we need to innovate in experiences just as in goods and, and services. Uh, and, and that's where the locus of in innovation has actually shifted over the last few decades. I mean, obviously, we still innovate a lot in goods and services. You still got to do that. But mm -hmm. what's happened as we shift in the experience economy is that goods and services have become commoditized. I mean, commoditized where, where people don't care about the brand or the features and benefits. Uh, they come to care about three things and three things only. And that's price, price, and price. And in fact, people want goods and services to be commoditized, bought at mm. the cheapest possible price, at the greatest possible convenience, in order to spend their hard-earned money and their hard-earned time on the experiences that they value. So, so to forestall the forces of, of commoditization, you basically have, have three choices, right? Three, in, and it's all innovation, right? You can innovate in your good, man, you know, like in your manufacturing business, you can innovate in your service business, you continue to do that, Right. And then those will be commoditized as well. But you, you're on this treadmill of innovation. You can never stop, which mm -hmm. which obviously is something companies should do anyway. Uh, two, you can innovate in customization again because customization lifts you up. It's the antidote to commoditization. Mm 
And commoditization is like the law of gravity. If you do nothing else, you will be commoditized. But you elevate your business because you're differentiating yourself by working with each individual customer and what they need. Or you can shift up what I call this progression of economic value to, to if you're a manufacturer, to innovate not just in goods, but in services and experiences. Uh, and if you're a service provider, you can innovate in services and experiences as well. So you need to, to innovate at those three levels to, um, to, to avoid commoditization, basically. How, how does the whole digitalization that's ha happening and, and, and going to happen Im impact the um, experience economy? Uh, two, two basic things, one, good, one bad, one good, right? The bad one is the internet is the greatest force of commodization ever invented. Yeah. Right, the frictionless marketplace, you can instantly compare prices from one vendor to another, and it tends to push you down to the lowest possible price. And COVID, of course, the pandemic accelerated that because it taught if you hadn't bought, and there's, there were still you know hundreds of millions of people who never bought anything on the internet. Well, now most all of those have, and they get it delivered to their home, or they pick it up with contactless delivery. They don't go into a store. And we're teaching people that that uh, you don't need to go into stores, you don't need to buy from physical places, and that has you know uh, shifted forward that commoditization uh, even more. But the second thing is to well I, I, now now there's three of them, so now we're up to three. So <laughs> that I thought of it. So the second thing is um, is to understand that anything you can digitize, you can customize. Once it enters the realms of zeros and ones, you can instantaneously, costlessly, frictionlessly, seamlessly turn a zero to a one, right, with zero cost and customize uh, whatever it is to individuals. And many businesses are totally digital, uh, you know, where the product is digital. So, you know, all, all uh, financial products today are, are digital. Uh, entertainment is increasingly digitized. Uh, all the things we access over the Internet. Um, and so you can customize all that, but if not, you can digitize the process by which you make things, or you can digitize information about the product, the product in the process, including the sharing of that online so that people can customize things online and then have it, uh, you know, made or delivered, uh, just for them. And then the third aspect that I remembered as we were going along, um, is the, it's actually the basis of, of this, where we go there, that book right there, right there, right there. Right. Infinite possibility, that I mentioned earlier, creating customer value on the digital frontier, which mm -hmm. basically is all about how you use digital technology to fuse the real and the virtual, to create experiences that aren't possible in normal reality using augmented reality, virtual reality, and all these other means by which you, you fuse the, the real and the virtual. So we now have the ability to create new and wondrous experiences that have never before even been imagined because of the rise of digital technology. Yeah. How, how do you see that from attention? So there's, it's like, we just chatted that uh, about that. It was like before we recorded. So we have now been in a lockdown for quite some time. And it's kind of, we are all used to the digital and exchange. Like we talk right now on a digital screen to each other. And and you mentioned that you just started to to have physical meetings and presentations again. Yep. How how do you see the difference from an intention perspective and the engagement and the experience on digital and physical? Well, the, the as I as I learned from my father uh, very early in life, the answer to every question is it depends, <laughs> <laughs> and it depends on how you use the digital technology, right? Mm -hmm. If you use it in ways that I talk about in infinite possibilities, such as to, um, uh, I mean, well, to use the extreme example, you've got virtual reality where you're entirely immersed, your sight and your sound and increasingly your touch in there, you're paying no attention to anything else that, that's going on. And so you are totally immersed, all right? And, 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 it, and it grabs your attention probably even more so than in a real life, right? And, and largely because of, of one simple factor, you can't look at your phone with the headset on, <laughs> right? The yeah. smartphone is the number one competitor for attention for every business in the entire world. And, uh, and so it's, it's how do you keep people from looking at their smartphone, which is why other than that sort of thing, it in fact, digital technology makes it much worse to hold people's attention.
right? I could be in some wondrous physical experience somewhere, but I, my, my pocket buzzes and all of a sudden I pull that out and I just forget about whatever's going on. When we're in our Zoom meetings and so forth, we have all these distractions because they are not totally immersive as, as, uh, as many experiences are, not all of them. And, um, and therefore we, we divide our attention or you know, even on a screen, I've got multiple things going on and so forth. So, uh, so digital technology makes it incredibly hard to, to first capture and then keep somebody's attention. Yeah. How, how do you think businesses can utilize the knowledge we have now at our hands to design experience that capture the attention and bring, bring the attention as well to the next level where it's like, not just, Hey, there's an attention and you should see my product is also yeah. creating a bond with the brand, creating a bond with, with, with the company they engage with. Yeah, well, so so one thing to think about, uh, particularly with where you want people to capture people's attention about your product, is to recognize that advertising generally doesn't work all that well anymore. You know, digi whether it's digital advertising, whether it's physical advertising, whether it's on the air advertising, uh, whatever it might be, it's so easy for people to not pay attention to ads is the basic reason. And, uh, and now obviously there's, there are some great ads that work very effectively. There's some that you just by sheer repetition, they finally worm their, worm their way into our brain and so forth. Uh, but so what, what, and, and the other thing I'll mention about it related to my book, Authenticity, which is right there, <laughs> uh, is I just had to move it because I was, I was like, it was behind me and I had to move it where I could see it. So, um, um, one of the things that we talk about in authenticity is advertising also is a phoniness generating machine that, that marketers and, and their complicit ad agencies cannot help but exaggerate the product and what it's about, uh, do greenwashing and all those sorts of things and basically become not who they say they are in their ads. And so um, what you need to do, therefore, is to create what, I'll, what I call marketing experiences. Not quite the same thing as experience marketing. And experience marketing is more about how do we evoke the senses and make our mailers more dimensional and so forth. But I mean, you need to stage actual experiences, real or virtual, but actual experience, engaging experiences that do the job of marketing by generating demand for your offering. And that's something that, I mean, again, it's like experiences have always been around. This has always been around, but it's just the explosion of it in the last uh, you know, 20 or 30 years is amazing. You think about all of the wonderful brands that have flagship places um, uh, such as uh, Lego with Legoland, the Beeland in Denmark and all the other Legolands that experience hubs around the world. The Heineken experience in, in uh, Amsterdam, the Guinness Storehouse in Dublin, uh, Volkswagen's Autostadt in Wolfsburg, Germany, uh, Swarovski's Crystal Velten in Austria and on and on the list could go. Right. All these brands are getting into the experience business to get people to pay attention to, to their, their products. And then we actually have a model in Chapter 8 of Authenticity that is as much an experience model as, as an authenticity model. Um, but it's about, uh, it's a, we call it the placemaking portfolio. And the placemaking portfolio uh, is about, uh, um, about uh, it's a diamond model. So there's 10 levels, five physical, five virtual. And so there's the flagship location in the in the real world. There's there's your flagship website or your app in the virtual world. And how do you use that to engage people? It's the primary way that people interact with you. There are experience hubs in the real world, like um, uh, you know New York and Times Square in particular, Las Vegas, Las Vegas Strip, London's Piccadilly Circus, and you know Amsterdam, Singapore, Hong Kong, you know Tokyo, Akihabara, and other places. And you know you know and on and on that list could go. In the virtual world, there are experienced domains, you know, in particular social media sites, you know, YouTube, Facebook, um, uh, Instagram, and, and so forth. How do you engage people at those levels? There, there are major venues where you just go to a city with a population big enough for uh, to have a place like Apple stores. They don't have a huge flagship experience in, in Cupertino, California, but everywhere there's enough of population, boom, there's this the most amazing retail store in the world. Uh, there that uh, that's, that gets you to, to uh, buy Apple products. And there's major platforms in the um, in the virtual world where you have your own URL, like movie specialized this, right? Every big movie has its own movie site that you can go to 
you look, re, see the trailer, you get interviews with the stars and so forth to generate demand for that movie before it ever comes out. And then there are uh, derivative uh, placement in the, in the uh, real world where you go to somebody else's place and create experience inside of there, you know, like uh, Lego does in toy stores and, and, and so forth. And there's derivative, or the best example there is Kidzania. I don't know if you've ever heard of a Kidzania, but they're yes. like the most incredible kids' experiences in the world. And all of the experiences inside there are sponsored by major multinational brands or local brands, whether it's in Jakarta, Mexico City, or wherever it might be. Uh, and people go there to get access to kids and their parents and show them show off their products there. Uh, you can have derivative placement in in the real world where you go to somebody else's website and have an, an experience in there. And then finally, in the center of the model is the two ones where you're looking for ubiquity, uh, and that's and that's the World Wide Web and worldwide markets, right? Being everywhere people want to be, and how do you how do you go there? So these are all. It's probably more than you wanted to hear, Jens, but all uh, uh, yeah, that that's uh, all the uh, places where you can create experiences that generate demand for your offering. So I would like to to switch gears and go into business and business from a context of. You have been working with some of the biggest companies and biggest brands in, in the world. And I would like to pick your brain a little bit, uh, yep. if, if you are able and willing to say it. What, is the, what have been the, the most objections from the executives you have been engaging with? Um, was the number one or two things? The, 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 well, uh, one is, well, that's not what we do. <laughs> uh. We don't do that. And... Um, And, all, and it really, it all comes down to mindset. You got to have the mindset. You got to recognize that you you can be in the experience business. Perhaps you should be in the experience. Even you are in the experience business, and then you can generate those experiences and innovate them. And and uh, um, you know, and people always want to know about ROI and that sort of thing, which is harder to imagine with experiences than others. But there's way, ways around that. But the other one is, is one I'm sure you've heard in other contexts or well, uh, as well, right, is who's already done that in our industry? Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> come on. Can I copy paste? Yes. <laughs> And it's like, but it, it's not an innovation if somebody else has already done it, right? We need You need to innovate, not just copy paste what other people have done. So one of the things you you wrote, write on on your website on Strategic Horizon is you enable people to see the world differently. Yeah. How are you doing that with people who are like throwing straight away at you? It's like we're not an experienced business. That's not <laughs> our way of how right. we think. It's it, well, it's it's the power of frameworks, right? I think in pr frameworks. You know, every once in a while, somebody will say, "Oh, you're a motivational speaker," and it's just like people's fingernails on a chalkboard. No, I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm not here to entertain you, right? It's about showing you what is going on in the world, and 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 the progression of economic value. Again, commodities, goods, services, experiences, and even one more out there uh, is is about how economies change and how you and and so. The, bogey, the boogeyman I use is, is commoditization, right? You know, I, I often end talks by, with, with these exact words, is you can stay in the illusory safety of past practices and keep on doing the same things you've always been doing. Well, then mark my words, you will be commoditized. Or you can shift up this progression of economic value to staging experiences for each one of your individual customers, and then you'll be economically rewarded. So is, is that convincing the CEO or executive when you tell them, hey, there are different frameworks and they will help you to, to do that? How, 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 how do you get them from, we're not at all into that to, yeah, let's open a little bit up. There must be right. something true. He has written a couple of books now. So <laughs> there must be something in that. Well, it, you know, so, so one is, is the power of the framework itself because people will see that. You know, and, and, and two related to that is to get them to see it in their own lives. Get them to see how much of their own lives is spent in experiences versus buying goods and services. How much they themselves like goods and services commoditized. Uh, and and so you and so one of the things you often do in, in starting work with companies is take them on an experience expedition. Go to New York or Chicago or Las Vegas. Go to Amsterdam or London. Uh, go to Sydney, Australia, and let's show you what it's like out there. Show you some of the best experiences in the world, as well as maybe one or two of the worst. 
so you can then develop principles. So the other thing that's related to what you said about copy paste is I always tell companies don't uh, don't practice best practices, right? Best where well, you are copying what somebody else is doing. Instead, embrace best principles. Best mm -hmm. principles is where you look at what his company is doing and you look at its situation. And then you and, and you extract out the principle and say, okay, let us apply it to our company and our situation. So that's what I use exemplars for. It's not to say you want to copy this company, whether it's in your industry or outside of your industry. In fact, it's usually better outside of your industry to understand what's going on, but look at the principle. So at the end of the, the we debrief the experience expeditions. And the last thing you do is, is a best principles exercise. All right, write down all the principles that each one of these um, um, exemplars are doing including a negative principle if they're if they're if they're a bad one and then then write down how might you apply that same principle in your business right open up their eyes see the possibilities now obviously you often have to um, um uh, pilot things and prototype things and test things out before you go whole hog in it some companies don't immediately get it um you know I, i'm thinking of um hospitals in, uh, in particular, I do, I do more work probably with in the healthcare industry than any other because research shows that the better the patient experience, the better the outcomes. And that's what yeah. healthcare is really all about. So they can say, they can like, okay, we need, really need to do this if for, uh, you know, for that reason alone, much less the, the other reasons that it, that it makes sense. So you, you just said one thing which, which got, got me thinking. So you're taking an executive on a trip to experience and feel it themselves. So it, so that yep. it's it's kind of shifting their mindset, but you shift the mindset from a heart perspective, not from a brain perspective. If exactly. I understand you right. Exactly. And, yep. and I mean then, both, but right, but you but it's not just intellectual knowledge. It's it's you're engaged in it, you're feeling it yourself, and you then see it better than you would otherwise if I was just given a you know presentation or a workshop. Yeah. If if we if we look ahead now now you have three three versions of your book and and I would I would like to touch that even more but if we first look ahead so what do you see we're now coming slowly if ever out of a pandemic state and and most like like we discussed before most properly we will need to learn to live with it yep um how do you see the experience economy going into the future from, from today on with what has happened over the last two years? Um, the, well, one is um, we have, uh, during the pandemic, we still had our experiences. They just were no longer out there. They were in here, right? No longer physical. Mm -hmm. They were digital, no longer social and communal, but, but familial and individual, right? So, so, but now we're opening up again and, and pretty much any place that opens up, whatever capacity it might be, guess what? It gets filled up. There's tremendous yeah. pent up demand for the, for, for that experience. So it's something that we can now is a good time to, to access that demand and do things uh, uh, for it. Um, secondly, I'll say that you, that the increasing need to customize those experiences. So often experiences are still mass experiences. Think about going to a theme park and, and uh, going to a show and a concert and a play and so forth, a sporting event, uh, they're all mass experiences. They're not, and nothing is done differently because of who you are, what you want, what your individual desires are. But here now where you overlay any of that with digital technology allows mm -hmm. you to start to customize that, particularly with, with experience platforms. The rise of, I just finished a multi-client study and we're coming out with a toolkit on experience platforms so companies see how they can get into that business where they create a platform that allows many people to get individually what they need from all the different modules of, of possibility that, that, that are out there. So customization is, is a key. Uh, third is, I think you see, and, and, and because of the pandemic, a trend that was already there, but now increasing, is staging experiences that are not merely memorable, but are also highly meaningful. That, that one of the things the pandemic does is it make us realize that that what brings meaning to our lives is the experiences that we have with our loved ones, with our family, our, our friends, our colleagues at, at work, um, that that's what life is about. And so we need to to 
uh, not just provide memorable experiences, but even more so meaningful experiences as well. And then finally, I'll mention that, uh, that I briefly uh, alluded to really quickly about one more offering after experiences. And that I think is increasingly coming to the fore. And um, it's you know with the same heuristic where customization is the antidote to commoditization, right? That, that as customization drags you down, cust uh, or commoditization drags you down, customization lifts you up. Mm. So what happens when you customize an experience, which can be commoditized as well? When you, when you design an experience, it's so appropriate for this particular person, exactly the experience that they need at this moment in time, then you, you can't help but turn to what we often call a life transforming experience or an experience that changes us in some way. And that I call a transformation. So a transformation is the fifth and final economic offering in this progression of economic value, commodities, goods, services, experiences, and transformations. We're using experiences now as the raw material to guide people to change to help them achieve their aspirations. Now, many businesses are naturally in the transformation business. You know, think about fitness centers. Why do people go to fitness centers and endure all that work, sweat, and pain? They think the gain will be worth it, right? They want to become more fit. Healthcare that I mentioned, outcomes, right? Healthcare is about the outcome. Transformation is about outcomes. Inputs don't matter. The goods, yeah. the services, even the experiences you provide don't matter if somebody has an aspiration and they don't achieve that. That's the outcome that they are looking for. And so, so you know, um, uh, university environments, management consulting, uh, coaches of all stripes, right? If anybody that's a coach is in the transformation business and that possibility there exists for everybody, just like the experience possibility exists for everybody. Whatever business you're in, even if you're a B2B manufacturer of goods, right? Recognize, guess what? No customer of yours wants your goods, wants what you offer, right? Wants the goods. They are but a means to an end. And if you sell the end rather than the means, then you'll gain much more economic value. It's why you see companies like IBM shift from selling hardware to managing your data center and giving you business consulting to help you have a better business, which is what yeah. in the end you want from them. Huh. Love that. So shifting gears towards your, your book. So as I mentioned already, it's like you have now three versions of the book or it's yep. like newer versions three editions yeah editions yeah that's the better word <laughs> that's the, that's the G german english <laughs> <laughs> what what are the things um that has changed and that brought you to the point that you want to release a new version of it um that's that's a good question so well one is um The, you know, the first edition, the second edition, excuse me, we call updated edition came out in 2011. So we started thinking about it after the book had been out a decade and recognize. So, so a little, a little known fact of the business book world, uh, or actually a, a, even fiction books as well, uh, right? They first come out in hardcover and then they come out in softcover, right? When do they come out in softcover? When it stops selling in hardcover. <laughs> right. Uh, some cases that six months, some cases a year or two. We were still selling thousands of copies a year in hardcover, you know, 10, 12 years after it came out. And so it never been put into, into softcover. They never made it. And so one is they're thinking about, okay, maybe it's finally time to do it. And we said, well, then let's update it. Let's make it really worth it. And so so uh, we updated it fr front to back. I mean, all the frameworks are there. We added some new ones. Uh, all the ideas are there. We added some new ones. Nothing that we wrote before was invalidated in any way, which I'm, which I'm very proud of. But some of the examples were old. Some of the examples, frankly, didn't make it, right? Because when you have a lot of innovation, guess what? Not everybody's going to make it. So we updated a lot of the examples and so forth. And then um, and then it got to be the, you know, thinking about when the, 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 the 20th anniversary Uh, was coming around. Uh, we thought about it, uh, you know, again, so sort of like those every 10 years. Uh, and and we recognized that, you know, we know a lot more than we did back then. Uh, you know, there, there wasn't hardly any mention of digital technology in the, in the, in the first book, uh, for example. And so we really wanted to put it into context of today. And that's where we hit upon the construct of competing for customer time, attention, and money. I mean, these are the currencies of the experience economy. And every company competes against every other company in the world for time, attention, and money. 
even yeah. other companies in different industries and in different geographic areas. Because guess what? Time is limited. We only have 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we, we got to sleep sometime. But if I'm spending my time with some company and the experience they create, guess what I'm not doing is I'm not spending time with you. And attention in today's media fragmented world with the rise of the smartphone is um, uh, increasingly scarce. But if somebody creates a great experience, I've got my time there and I'm giving them un my undivided attention. What am I not doing is I'm not giving that attention to you. And money, of course, is consumable. If I have a dollar or a euro to spend and I spend it with some other company in some other geographic area, guess what I can't do with that dollar again? Because I can't spend it with you. It's gone. So that's why we need to recognize that because of that, we really we we will be commoditized if we don't think about how we shift into the experience economy or even into uh, guiding transformations. Hmm. Why should people still read all three versions? <laughs> well, it, so one one is for the previews alone. You know, we, we call our pre normal preface, but but we call it a preview because we we take we take a, a view of, of staging, right? That that mm. the subtitle of the original book was "Work is Theater and Every Business is Stage," so so it's it's not chapters, it's acts, and and there's an intermission in the middle, and there's a there's a uh, preview, and there's an encore, and the previews are different in every one, and it really does set the stage for the entire book in the context of that time. So I think they're worth reading just for that. Um, there and and then there there are other things in there that you see how how things have changed and what we've been able to add over time, as well as see you know see what we we're thinking at the time and what were the best examples back there in 1999. And it gives you a glimpse to see okay how the world has changed uh, in those uh, you know two two and a half decades. Last question. I had, and by the way, I just had somebody from Australia email me this morning and said, I got a hold of your first edition. <laughs> so yeah, it's awesome. read that one too. Fits to that question. So go, going on a personal level, you, you talked about transformation. How did this book transform your life? Well, it uh, it obviously opened up uh, new vistas and new opportunities to work with companies. Mass customization is a huge thing, but it's not as big as the experience economy. I mean, if I had never discovered, I'm, I'm sure I could be, would still be making a living just talking about that. But um, um, it meant that I was able to touch many more people, many more businesses, be able to reach many more and and therefore be a bigger change in the world. And that, that's key. You know, that I, I say my my personal meaningful purpose in business is to understand what's going on in the world of business and then develop frameworks to first describe what's happening and then prescribe what companies can do about it. You know, so there's many individual clients that I work with myself and be able to see what a difference that makes. But also, you know, I every once in a while I just get somebody's like, I saw a video of yours, right? It changed my life. I read your book. I no longer think the same way. I changed look at what I've done to my business because of that. And that mm -hmm. always is is incredibly gratifying to know that that is going on out there. Yeah. Great. So getting us into the last part of the podcast, which is slightly out of context. Um, but of course you can connect it if you want to. Um, first question. If you can work with a project that's impacting every human being on earth, what project would you choose to work on, work with, and why? <laughs> wow. That impacts every person on earth. Well, the, the, you know, other than the air we breathe, right? About the only thing that you think of in business that's impacting every person on earth uh, is, in fact, the internet. And the ability to to make connections to everyone as well as to every company, and there are people talking about, including uh, Tim Berners Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, about what needs to happen next. You know, to fix many of the issues uh, that we have, including all the the deleterious effects of social media and so forth. So I'd have to say it would be uh, that that would be the uh, uh, the basket that I would uh, work in uh, to uh, to make a difference there. And to make, you know, make it much more transformative experience. Where will you be in a year from now? You can answer that from a personal perspective or business perspective. Um, a year from now, I will be fully traveling the globe again. 
<laughs> and uh, and being able to do that, I do have I do have uh, um, you know I, I think you mentioned earlier I had my first business trip last week since COVID happened. Everything has been virtual, and it was just sort of like wonderful to be with people and to talk and that. And I've got many more coming up, including overseas trips this fall. Uh, that one in Australia wants me to bring to, uh, to go to Australia in February, March. We'll see if that that happens. Um, and so I think to be with people, to see the difference that I can make to and and make a better difference, because it's much, you know, that 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 um, you know, zooming and 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 all these other methods are just not as good as being there physically with people. But it also means I get to experience the world again. It's like I, I don't go any place exotic without you know spending an extra day or two and and see what I can learn. That's 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 my research is to is okay. to experience things around the world. Last question: How do you keep yourself up to date and informed on topics that interest you? Uh, I read three daily newspapers. It used to be four, but the Financial Times out of London stopped publishing in, in uh, Minnesota in the U.S. where I'm at. Uh, so I read th four daily newspapers. I have Google alerts and all the topics of, of interest to me. I have a number of newsletters that I read online. I read uh, scores of books a year. I have uh, scores of subscriptions to magazines. And uh, I interact, but but then the two biggest ones that I mentioned the the experiencing places for myself to see what's out there. I got a, tr a speech in New York, and I'm already planning out. Okay, here's all the you know there's like five or six different experiences that I want to see while I'm there in in New York City. And then lastly, it's the working with clients to be able to 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 see my ideas and frameworks. Uh, uh, come up against what they're thinking and what they're trying to accomplish and see what new innovations can result from that. And that's when I learn the most. Hmm. Joe, thank you very much for spending your morning with me. It was a pleasure having you on the show and I learned a lot and I hope the listeners learned a little bit as well. Thank uh, you very much for being my, on the show. My pre pleasure, Jens. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to today's episode. You will find the links and resources in the show notes of this episode. If you would like to support the podcast, the most impactful thing you can do is subscribing to the show on any of the podcasting platforms and give me a review. This will help me to reach more innovators around the world and bring some of you into the show. If you have any question to the guest or want to engage with me, feel free to reach out to me on my public WhatsApp at plus four nine one five one seven zero three three one one seven six i will repeat plus four nine one five one seven zero three three one one seven six it's all whatsapp texting only or follow me on social media and contact me there and finally if you look for someone educating you or your team on innovation culture coaching have a look at heightlandinnovation.com thanks and see you in the next episode